What terrifies men the most? Is it the fear of being buried alive? Is it demons? Is it dramatic flares, flashbacks of trauma, horror? Nah, nah, I'll let you all know what men truly fear. It's commitment. <laughs> Hello, my precious lambs. Welcome to my horror dome this evening. <laughs> you wanna see me play with the veil more because I could do this all day long, baby. <laughs> I could do this all day long. But yes, no, and, and uh, yeah, so what do you all think? Should we get started with the, with the course? We have a lot to get through. Oh, okay, yes, the veil is still on point. Perfect. <laughs> All right, everybody. So just to a little soft introduction to what we're going to be doing today. Today, in terms of our subject, which is fine art and horror, uh, there are so many different genres of horror. There's, um, uh, there, there's so many different like subcategories and horrors, I should put it, because you have the horror films that are sci-fi related, like Alien. Uh, then you have other ones that are like revenge of nature, where you get like creature from the Blue Lagoon and giant centipedes coming after you and King Kong. There's a lot, a lot of subcategories in horror films. Um, but what we're going to focus on today are specifically ones and little ties with art history that relate to this specific phrase. We make up horrors to help us cope with the real ones. Isn't that intriguing, that concept, that we make up horrors so that we can deal with the real ones in our waking life? And that is the theme of tonight's, uh, of tonight's horror flick, I should put it. <laughs> hence, the, hence the commitment veil. <laughs> But, um, but yes, so um, like I said, we're just going to start with a soft intro. Now, the first thing that we think about um, with horror films, or at least the first references to horror and horrifying creatures, I should say, are demons. And what I mean by demons, the like we think of, okay, little guys with pitchforks and horns and razor sharp teeth and little talons. Uh, we have been able to see these like little demonic creatures, I should put it, or little satanic figures, all the way back even to Egyptian periods, and we can even see it in like you know, like you know throughout throughout every period of history almost. Like every sto good story has an antagonist, and I feel like we always used demonic references. To like, add, like to add content to our to our stories, like to have that little evil figure that represents us, whether if it's um, some like reference to our lust, our greed, our I I don't know to like our just inhumanity, and that is what I find so intriguing about these little demonic beasts, and um, like I said, you can even find them in. Um, Asian cultures, as well as the Western and European, uh, lots to say, lots to say. Oh, fear mode, thank you for joining us. Oh, your username is perfect for tonight's stream as we are doing art and horror tonight, as you can tell. <laughs> I'm the embodiment of commitment, thank you very much. But, uh, but it's like in reference to, so like I said, most of these images that we see, when we look back in history, they're mostly little devils with pitchforks and horns, and which hasn't really changed much in today's society. But one artist, one artist that did an exceptional job in transforming that image for us is Hieronymus Bosch. Now, Hieronymus Bosch was a Northern Renaissance artist. He wasn't part of the Italian movements. The Northern Renaissance was a very different, um, like, it had a very different, how should I put it, influence. Like, in the north, things are a lot darker, they're a lot colder, so naturally the colors are different. The, even, like, in, it was actually in the Northern Renaissance 
that they invented oil painting. You would think it would have been the Italian, but really it was in the north. And, um, and Hieronymus Bosch, you can't tell by these images, but he is an incredible, incredible detail painter. He, like, these are to, all these that I'm showing you are close ups of what he does. Like, oh, Giga Datum, thank you for the sub. Thank you for the sub. Oh, you're gonna love this course, okay? Look, Giga, look at me. I dressed up as commitment. <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, I digress. I had to say that one more time. Okay, um, so yes, yeah, so what is so great about Hieronymus Bosch is that he took religious narratives. He took references of the Garden of Eden, um, like, and especially a lot in terms of hell. He was really obsessed with images of hell and damnation. <laughs> and... Uh, and he, but he took the image of these little demonic creatures a step further. He added an insane amount of symbolism to his work. And, um, and he didn't use the traditional forms of little guys with pitchforks. Like, as you can see, we have them with armor and helmets. They even have um, a lot of fish motifs. <laughs> um, even just like, uh, and as well like a lot of um, human body parts. So there's something, um, animalistic and humane about them as well. But, uh, but what many people don't realize is that Hieronymus was actually a bit of a heretic for his times. Like, even though he's here making altarpieces for churches, like what you're seeing right here, like that image right there, is the image of hell made for an altarpiece. Um, but, he, but he subtly combined little pieces of heresy into his work. Um, <laughs> he, he loved this idea of portraying our desires and our fears all in one through his creatures and through his continuous narratives. Like, as you can see here in this altarpiece, there's just multiple little scenes that we can all pick through. And each scene portrays either a different sin or a different um, fear of some sort. Uh, like. For instance, that image of the hand that you're going to see coming up pretty soon, which is of a hand with a knife going through it, holding a little dice at the end. Yeah, that was actually a reference to gambling, like the sin of gambling. Now, back then, it was a big sin, you know? And uh, there you go. There's another dice right there. That's all part of the same scene. And uh, yeah, no, so he was very witty in the ways that he approached this, like, the, his approach to horror and punishment and fear it was i don't know it was a form of pessimistic fantasy and the, does that make sense pessimistic fantasy it is pure fantastical we have like even in hell there's full of like instruments and music you can almost hear the sounds of hell ringing through your ears um, that's the reason why like Hieronymus Bosch was so unique in what he does you it's very sensory and you could stare looking at it for hours but um, but yeah but most specifically what you want to take away from Hieronymus Bosch is his use of fantasy and how he combines them with fear and horror and demonic forms all in one all to the end these were images in churches which i find hilarious <laughs> it's like the reverse of a disney world exactly it's like the reverse of a disney world if we were to make alice in wonderland 50 billion times more horrifying that's what you would, that would probably be hieronymus bosch right here <laughs> there's some things like i said even though there is um, a lot of symbolism and meaning in terms of his work it doesn't matter you just get lost in it and as long as you just feel this sense of torment and just the unsettling animals and creatures that are roaming around, then you're good. That is the, that's the essence that he was trying to portray. <laughs> Let's see, uh, you know, I don't know what it is, but something about you tells me you're not an e-girl. <laughs> oh no, Gooey Gurner, I apologize. I'm, I'm not an e-girl. <laughs> At least for tonight, I am the embodiment and fear of commitment. <laughs> as you can tell. But, uh, but I digress, I digress. Now, like I said, I promised you guys some films. And right now we're going to watch a bit of this film that 
is act, it's not classified as horror, but it influenced a lot of horror films. It is actually a surrealist. It's actually a, a surrealism film made by Salvador Dali. Who here knows Salvador Dali, right? The guy that made all the dripping clocks coming off from the, the tree branches and uh, the lobster on, on the telephone. I, I would be very concerned if you guys don't know Salvador Dali, but, um, but if you don't, I'm sure you'll be able to recognize some motifs in his film that we're about to watch. Oh, you've been to the museum in Tampa. Oh, I've been dying to go. I've been dying to go, little white ball. <laughs> you've heard his name before? Oh, well then you're in for a treat because very few people have seen this film by Salvador. Now, like, let me turn off my music here. Now, Salvador Dali, what happened, is he got together with a Spanish filmmaker. They met together one day and they like they each had this very bizarre dream and they said and they told each other their dream and they said we should combine them and make them into a film. And they thought, yes, let's do it. Let's let's just go for it. Let, I don't care who says what, let's just make this. And that is what um, came of this and that's how this film was created. It's called The Andalusian Dog or Unchan Andalu. <laughs> and um, and what I did, this isn't the full film, but I cut it up into little bits and pieces for you guys, at least some that I feel, think to be the most compelling moments of the film. But yeah, so pay close attention to the imagery, because the next film we're going to see is very closely related to this. <laughs> Has anyone ever seen Pan's Labyrinth? Saying. This one was made way before then. But yeah, no, so what Dali and the director said to each other, which is very interesting, which is really the core essence of surrealism. Do not dwell on what is required purely rational, physiological, or cultural expectations. Open the way to the irrational. It was accepted only that which struck us, regardless of its meaning. Now that, granted, I think that was a little bit of a poor in, like Spanish to English translation, but they just said, you know what, it doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense entirely. We don't want it to make sense, we just want them to feel something. Oh, thank you for following Mono, Mono. that's really sweet of you, thank you. You love magical realism, yes. If you love magical realism, definitely watch this film all the way through. Like right here, we're getting the journey of a toothbrush. A toothbrush as he goes through like this like medical scene. Now right here what we have, it, like, there's been a lot of interpretations behind it, but, the mo but I think the best one is there's this man that is trying to propose to this woman, or at least have a go with her, so to speak. And she wants nothing to do with him, obviously. But they wanted to take this approach of portraying the fear of, you know, like, of, like the fear of man, of, of, of a woman's virtue and femininity, and also the fears of, as you can see by what I'm wearing, marriage. Like, here he comes, what, you know, this is a very surrealist representation, okay? Two grand pianos. <laughs> a giant bleeding, but I can only assume are either donkeys, like, I think they're donkeys, on top of these. As well as dangling along these two figures with them. Now, I can... At least in terms of my interpretation, I interpret these two figures like the children to come, the promise of food, the promise of home, but also with all of it, it comes this baggage. You can see by the way he struggles. And the poor woman is freaking terrified. <laughs> I don't blame her. Yeah, that image right there of the hands with the ants was what Dali dreamt in his dream, and so they had to put it in the, in the film. It's 
So yeah, so as you can see, it is a non-linear narrative. It kind of jumps between scenes. You don't know who's the protagonist. Is it this archaeologist? Is it the woman? Is it the toothbrush? Oh, Purple Prince, thank you. <laughs> Has anyone seen Silence of the Lambs? Just saying, that was the same moth from that film. Yeah, right here, remember this scene. And that's where it cuts off. So, at least this is the most I want to provide you guys for this. Um, for this lesson because it is a pretty long, even though it's a short film, it's a pretty long film. But uh, what was fascinating about this film is that apparently uh, on the night it aired in theater, the director along with Salvador, they were in the back and the director was so terrified by what people, how people were going to react to the film, like because it was a, a bit controversial. Like they, you back then, films were supposed to give you a very direct answer and a very direct narrative. And there's a lot of little scary motifs and um, and horror elements in Kira, and he was afraid of the backlash that he was going to face. So, the director actually had uh, stones in his pockets. So he was prepared to throw them back at the audience if they if they got a bit too rowdy, but uh, but yeah no. So even though this is a surrealist film, it like I said, it 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 really did make people think differently about horror and like at least going forward in terms of future horror films. <laughs> Don't worry, purple friends. I have not gotten married. I am just embodying the fear of commitment for tonight. <laughs> and also, I I really like wearing a veil. <laughs> it becomes me. Um, but yeah. So going back to that scene of the woman and this man pursuing her. She was basically seeing this promise of marriage and this promise and pursuit of this man. Um, she really saw it as like a fear, like this this fear and sacrifice of losing her individuality and um, just becoming a part of this big baggage that he was pulling across. And that brings us into the next chapter of our horror sequence, which is this idea of sacrifice. I know, right? Things are going to get progressively darker as we get along through this course. <laughs> I think the fear of failure is pretty embedded into the mind of men. Yes, fear of failure as well. I definitely have that fear too. And I think it's especially prevalent in our, like in our millennial society nowadays. Most certainly so, most certainly so. Because life is like so fast paced and we feel like we're just trying to catch up to everyone else or like be like everyone else. So yeah, no, the fear of failure is very true. Let's see. So like I said, now we're moving on to our next chapter, which is sacrifice. Now, <laughs> horror and sacrifice go hand in hand very closely, and we see these. Now, I'm willing to get any form of backlash here, but this is purely art history, okay? I did not write history, but sacrifice and horror are very closely tied, and the best way, one of the best art pieces that I've seen that is that has exposed this was during the 14th century when German like when uh let's see yes Germans actually invented the Pietà now when I say the Pietà it is this devotional image of like the virgin mother and the and and the dead body of her of her son Jesus now you have to think this was during the time in the 14th century people were running wild okay <laughs> they were generally running wild um because there was a lot of famine there was plague uh there there was war everything was going to pot okay <laughs> and um there was no order people were just doing whatever they wanted and the church said okay we need to find a way to ground people. We need to find a way to bring people back to church. 
And up till then, all the images that you had seen of that you had seen of Jesus, uh, they were very they were like, you know, very placid, idolized. There were like even the crucifixes were just meh. You know, they were pretty, they were there. Uh, but the the Germans who were except like there's no in between there during that time there was no in between in terms of their emotions you either had extreme happiness or extreme extreme sadness and they were like well we don't want to make them happy when they come to church every sunday so we're going to make them feel bad <laughs> and, and and you know it's kind of like when you're having that argument with your friend and you and you tell them um like don't you dare bring my mother into this. And they're like, no, I'm going to do it. Like, don't you dare bring my mother into this. Oh, you bet I am. Don't you dare bring my mother. And lo and behold, they did. Um, <laughs> they wanted people to feel so bad that they wanted to show the grief and mourning of the virgin mother having lost her son. And to take it an even step further, they completely emaciated these figures. They are brown, they are decrepit, lifeless, like totally like covered in dripping blood. I mean, it was ghastly, but here the, the church was exploiting the use of horror in order to get people to evoke prayer and to ground them and to feel bad about themselves, basically. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> it, like horror doesn't just exist and exist in the films that we see today. It even back then in the 14th century, we saw it in our own churches. <laughs> the, the church does teach guilt to your DNA. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can attest to that. Yeah, that's, there's something to that, I'll say so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's, they just wanted to shock you with the level of grief and like pity and, like I said again, horror, though, for lack of a better word. <laughs> oh. Montreal, thank you for the follow. Thank you so much. Yes, it's beautiful to get a follow in this moment. I was, I was a little nervous showcasing this piece, but it is actually a very important uh, moment in history. Uh, it wasn't until the 16th century that they stopped doing the Pietas so gruesomely. Um, it was thanks to Michelangelo in Italy that gave us the beautiful marble Pieta that we see in the like um, that we see now in in Rome. But uh, but until then, this was what we got. <laughs> Uh, another example of this art form taking place is what we see in the Insheim altarpiece. Now, this is just the central panel of it, uh, which is the crucifixion. Again, like I said, as you can see here, the lifeless Jesus is so incredibly gruesome. <laughs> I mean, like almost down to pure barren bones, even the way the hands just kind of come up like this, like claws. Uh, they generally wanted you to feel the pain. Like Grunewald, he, as an artist, he was more of like, he, he was like a Renaissance man. He was an engineer. He was a bit of an architect, but uh, he did believe in this idea of using horror to create that shock value in, in like for the viewer. And, um, and this was his piece that most excellently represented that. And um, so as you can see here at the, the Pietà I showed you was from the 1300s, and here we are in the 1500s, and they're still using horror to this day. <laughs> um, at least to that day, I should say. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but like I said, this was to reference sacrifice. And now there's been a lot of movies that hinge on the, uh, that, that try to use the idea of sacrifice to scare the viewer. We've seen movies uh, with with tribes hidden in the like, the tropical in the tropics that are maybe like cannibals and they try to eat you. We've also seen um, a lot of like pagan films. Uh, what else? Um, oh, even like satanic cults using sacrifice as well. Usually trying to sacrifice our main protagonist. But um, but I think the one that most excellently does it is one called The Wicker Man. Who here has seen The Wicker Man? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I know my accent can be a little weird. The Wicker Man, the Wicker Man, the Wicker Man. Da, 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 da. <laughs> no, no one's seen it? Well, in any case, you're about to see a few scenes from it. Um, 
the Wicker Man, though, it, it like they, it, it was said by an art critic that you'll never know the true meaning of sacrifice until you've seen the Wicker Man. But Nicolas Cage, uh, no, no, it doesn't have Nicolas Cage, actually. This was, um, maybe there was a redone made with Nicolas Cage, but this one, um, I think, is a bit different. This one, uh, that is a few iconic scenes from The Wicker Man. Now, I wanted to show little glimpses of that scene because... You know, it's a it, it's a really great represent. Like, I mean, it gets very dark at various points of the film. I had to get take a lot of pieces out because I was afraid it, it would infringe on TOS. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like there, it, there's a lot of um, primitivism in the work. Uh, there's like this. There's a scene of a little girl who has a sore throat, and so they shove a little frog down her throat to get rid of the sore throat. And um, and it's just fascinating to see it in this modern society that this setting that they've created. It's not like it's a like um, it's an outcast civilization in the middle of nowhere. They're they, they're wearing modern clothing, modern. They have modern technologies, but they revert back to this form of primitivism. And like and also, it just addresses the like our fears of temptation, our fears of. You, you know, not following the crowd, so to speak. <laughs> Have you ever heard of spirit feasts? No, I haven't. I haven't heard of spirit feasts, though it sounds delicious. <laughs> What's that movie? Vertigo. That movie is actually The Wicker Man uh, with Christopher Lee. I highly recommend watching it. I think you can watch the full movie on YouTube. I, it, they definitely took um, inspirational... Um, elements from that movie to inspire uh, certain ones for um, uh, for um, Tim Burton. So I think you would enjoy looking at it, but I'm not going to lie, it's not for the faint of heart, guys. Not for the faint of heart. You have to really be in the mood for suspense and just downright absurdity. That's the thing about the film. It, ha it plays on this idea of absurdity and um, and, it's, and they really use a lot of like these masks, these animalistic masks, this anonymity, like um, to create all like these characters that are kind of frightening and also theatrical at the same time. Um, so spirit feasts are simulated cameralism. Oh, okay, okay, not my cup of tea, not my cup of tea. Uh, but interesting, I'm gonna have to look that up. Thank you, thank you, Clear Joker. Um, I'm always, I'm always a person that loves researching everything so i'm definitely going to be taking your your notes from this <laughs> let's see um but going off this subject of masks like we've often associated masks with horror because they're connected to halloween at least for us or at least i should say all Hall hallows eve and um because you know there's this sense of intrigue <laughs> not to not to go off the title of this art piece, but the sense of intrigue behind the mask. You don't know if it's someone maybe attractive, someone horrifying. Uh, what lies behind the masks that we put on every day? Not even just the physical masks, but the symbolic masks. What masks do we wear to go to work? What masks do we wear um, to go to college and to stream, for instance? <laughs> that means for streaming. Um, and I love this piece by James Ensor. James Ensor, um, oh, he, I, how should I put it? Like, I know we're jumping between a lot of different art, art um, periods right now. Like, right now we've entered the era of symbolism. Now, Ensor really, really latched on to this symbolism art movement. And what I mean by the symbolism art movement, it worked on addressing irrational fears and desires and impulses. They wanted the they they wanted to steer away from the art institutions, like the art institutions that basically said you have to paint a certain way, you have to make narratives a certain way, they have to be about I don't know, myth mythological creatures or religious iconography. They wanted to steer away from all that. They wanted the artist to become the seer. Like basic, this is when the artist really started getting 
power in their own work and how and what subjects they wanted to portray and they really latched on to the idea of horror and fear for symbolism and like you can see in this piece this like you have this crowd of people wearing masks with empty eyes these empty eyed masks and they almost appear to be moving towards us you know that scene in a movie when like the monsters are slowly or the zombies are slowly moving towards you. This is that's the feeling he wanted to capture. And there's been a lot of debate as to whether that baby the woman in red is holding is alive or dead. You know, and so it's even the way it's painted and the way how he layered the paint, he put a very thick amounts of paint around like the faces themselves to make them look very contoured it leaves you feeling very unsettled. There's a sense of danger even because of the movement that is happening. You know, like if you're stuck in a dream and the zombies are moving towards you or the monsters are moving towards you and you can't move, that's what you wanted to portray. Like Clear Joker, Francisco Goya comes to mind well. You get an A plus star in my class because we are going to talk about Goya in this course. We definitely are. So please stick around because I have an excellent piece that we're going to talk about. Um, oh, Kareem, Kareem, oh, you, oh, Kareem, who is all the way halfway across the world, woke up just for this stream. Well, Kareem, welcome, welcome, welcomes. Uh, right now we're on the era of symbolism. And uh, we just finished talking about James Ensor and uh, we watched a little film <laughs> that I think you would really like is a little horror film, but it's going to get progressively darker as we move along, people, okay? So let's keep moving. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, no, I think in terms of masks, this is one of my favorite pieces from the sim sim symbolism era. And uh, the this next film that I'm about to show you guys, it's a silent film in French. Um, so hopefully none of you have seen it. It's called eyes without a face has anyone seen it eyes without a face is a black and white si like um it wasn't actually a silent film um what i have for you doesn't have music or audio but it was the it was the best quality imagery i can get of the film so i hope you guys don't mind that so i'm you're gonna hear me talk a lot more over this film <laughs> Now, do you ever get into the occult, the girl getting the eye slit? Um, well, this movie took a lot of inspiration from um, Salvador Dali's film that we just watched earlier. Like that scene with the toothbrush going over the eye, getting an eye slit. There's that scene, there was a very specific scene from that that was replicated in this film. So again, even though Dali was a surrealist and that wasn't necessarily a horror film, they took those elements of fantasy and put them in like, and they are able to inspire one of the most horrific movies of all time <laughs> that's a cool good billy idol song oh let's see is it um let's see is it playing yeah it is a good billy idol song let's see um uh, yeah so the movie we're talking about now Actually, they did have a Billy Idol music over this, but I felt like it ruined the, the film. <laughs> so I took out the audio uh, for you guys. But basically, it tells the story of this girl who was deformed in an accident. And so she has to wear this lifeless mask over her face 24-7 all the time. And but luckily for her, she is the daughter of a skin, a very famous skin graft surgeon. And he makes it his mission, his life mission, to try to fix her face. And there is one moment that he is actually able to fix her face, but it droops off and falls to the ground, very horrific scene. But the way how he goes about trying to fix her face is that he captures young women, takes them with it, like carries them with his assistant to the basement, where he will then go on to perform surgery to remove their face and put it on his daughter. But, uh, but yeah, no, like I said, I wish I could have the, I, I wish I could have the music for you guys, but this is truly an amazing, amazing film. They're, it's all set in a villa, but they've, the way they filmed it, they made the villa appear to be like a labyrinth and a labyrinth that 
basically reflects this poor girl's state of mind. That she is basically a prisoner trapped within her father's own experiments. And a lot of people say this was actually the prelude to Frankenstein. This tortured scientist desperately trying to create, like, you know, to, to say, to recreate his daughter's face, as you can see, she wasn't a sight for sore eyes. Yeah, I had to cut this scene a little bit for everyone, TOS, you know, but it's, it was truly something. The, artistry and the blood. <laughs> but as the movie continues, her father basically becomes obsessed and it doesn't become about his daughter anymore, it just becomes about him striving for perfection. And therefore, his daughter takes it into her own hands to set free his victim, like his victims. And again, the victims included these dogs that he actually used for his skin graft experiments. So even though this is a horror film, it's also a very empowering film at the very end because she's based, by her setting free everybody, she is assuming, like she's basically assuming her identity again. She's assuming her power. This film would be inspiring for me to make a new artwork. Yes, Kareem, yes, absolutely. Especially the Dali film. Um, definitely go back and watch it. You would like that one. A lot of surrealism like you have in your work. But this, what made this film especially um, important was this mask that they implemented. This mask that seemed to have this very ingrained sad face in it and um and that and that mask really resonated with filmmakers and storytellers alike um that film really went on to inspire a lot of future films like face off we talked about the nicholas cage earlier here's nicholas cage for you um i think literally the skin i live in was like a parallel to, like, to Eyes Without a Face. And um, last but not least, the, like, Halloween, the night he came home, where the director, he literally said, I wanted the mask of the killer to be just like the lifeless one in Eyes Without a Face. So I, I really love doing the, these lessons and bringing some of these old, like like older films back for us to look at because they were just so exceptionally powerful with not just the limited technology they had but um, but yeah just just how they the innovation the level of artistry and like storytelling they had to implement in order to make it successful nowadays I feel like Hollywood is just spurting out sequels after sequels and not making anything new. <laughs> Uh, but back then, everything was very different. You've seen Face Off a long time ago? Nice, Max. Nice. No, that is a good, that, that is a good film. I agree. That is a very good film. But, um, but yeah, but like I said, this is a horror class. And this is just a very short scene. This is like a two-second scene. But what many people don't realize um, in terms of like horror films and masks, uh, who here has seen Fan of the Opera? Like the like like the new the newest released one, because that one is nothing compared to the original Fan of the Opera. The original Fan of the Opera was made to be a horror film. It's your favorite Vertigo? Yes, it's one of my favorites too. Aw, oh, thanks Kareem. <laughs> I try my best. It's 
Norfolk, here is Christine, our protagonist, slowly removing the mask of the phantom. <laughs> now you guys have to think, now I laugh at this scene, but back then, it was really, really horrifying to see. <laughs> I mean, poor guy, they did not give him any, any room at all, like they didn't even give him a nice nose. <laughs> So yeah, so nothing to do with the classical, like, no more talk of darkness. <laughs> Forget these wide-eyed fears, I'm here with you, beside you. None of that. None of that music. Not, not, none of that. Not, none of the romance. <laughs> I know Vertigo is so painful to watch, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, that was when... Um, so when we think about mask and horror films, usually we think about Scream, we uh, think about um, funny movies, but uh, funny scary movies, I should say. Uh, but uh, <laughs> for the fan of the opera to this day remains one of the best. <laughs> for that reason, I shouldn't laugh. This is a horror thing, not a, not a comedy show. But anyways, <laughs> I think that was the most horrifying scene back in the 1950s or something. Yes, yes, it is one of the most horrifying ones. Um, I uh, I remember uh, many years back, my mom was telling me about the movie. I actually had to watch it now for this course. And uh, she did say that it was truly terrifying for the times. Uh, it really was, like that suspense of removing the mask, slowly taking it off. And the, the level of, of makeup, and because they didn't have the, the, the level of, um, how should I put it? Uh, they, they didn't have so so much um, makeup tools, I should say. What is the term? I don't know, I forget the term. But, uh, you know, that, that thing in movie making, the artistry of creating grotesque faces. <laughs> I, I, I should know this, I watched the reality TV shows on it. <laughs> Aw, Zitze, hey, welcomes, welcomes. <laughs> Glad you can join us. Um, but yeah, no, so what I love about the Fountain of the Opera, like I said, um, they made him very grotesque and like very like, you know, disfigured. But one, but not to say that disfigurement and horror doesn't apply in fine art, even in the 1990s. And the person that, the artist, I should say, the mastermind that made this the absolute best for what it is, is Francis Bacon. Now, I'm quoting Francis Bacon when I say this here. He wanted to create works of art that reflected the brutality of fact. The brutality of fact. And I think what he means by that is he wanted to reflect the brutal nature of man, human, uh, animal, space, like just our existence, fact being reality. And, um, <laughs> oh gosh, and so basically this was, you have to think, this is now we're in the era of post-war expressionism. So this is like, you know, after the world wars and like Francis Bacon just wanted to create something different. He wanted to create portraits that weren't idealized. He wanted to put furies into his work. He wanted to abstract his figures to their bare raw necessity. Like who who in the in the times would have had the the guts to do that, right? We've in we go to art school and we're all trained to make the face perfect, the symmetric symmetry perfect. But Francis Bacon came in and completely threw it out the window. He wanted horror and this the terrifying disfigurement of man inside and outside to be reflected in his work like and like he he did it to an extent that it's almost abstract like he's ba he's really abstracted the work at least like especially in the faces um and even in the and even in the scenery he always seems to put his figures in these very enclosed spaces and critics have described them, you can almost hear them screaming. You can almost hear the figures screaming from inside these very close contained, like, 
spaces, like these like almost architectural abstract forms that he's created to hold his figures. And um, like this piece right here, um, he puts like these flanking bodies of meat hanging from behind this, this like um, this almost papal like um, form like the like he did a lot of art pieces that were crucifixes that actually showed screaming popes <laughs> again going back to this idea of sacrifice and horror in um, in horror films but I digress I digress mm. so ultimately he just made them made these paintings and he made them very unsettling and the art world loved it they absolutely loved it his work is creative, but it takes time to understand it. Yes, it does take time. And the way how I tell people when it comes to artworks like Francis Bacon, it doesn't matter if you can recite exactly what each piece is word for word. If you can translate what it's the feeling that he's trying to portray, then you have achieved like, then that's all you need, basically. You have achieved what the artist was trying to portray. Because I think some of the best artworks are the ones that create shock value. And for, he was definitely one that does that. Like, Vertigo, these are really cool to look at. Yes, they... And honestly, I've been able to see these in person, a lot of these in person. And they don't come close, these digital images, to how magnificent they are in real life. Like, some aren't very big, but for the most part, there are these larger, they, there are these life-size paintings and they take up entire walls of the museum. And you, it, they're the pieces that I could stare forever at. It's like you stare at them and you dive in deep, not just into the, figure and their placement and how they're deformed but you dive into the soul of the piece you dive into your own melancholy your own uh traumas like your own unsettling unsettlement but it it keeps us there it keeps us lingering <laughs> i mean i can appreciate how much effort they do to come up with these ideas without having inspiration from pinterest i know right this was before pinterest now I'm all about the Pinterest myself. Um, but now they're the ones on Pinterest inspiring us. <laughs> how times have changed, how times have changed. Um, but yeah, no, so yeah, Francis Bacon, he did a lot of self-portraits. He did portraits of his friends. Uh, he did, uh, like I said, crucifixes, popes, you name it. Francis Bacon basically did it. Uh, but yeah, no, so I digress, I digress. Now, we've basically covered, guys, you realize we're, we're jumping leagues, leagues into, um, into art history here. And, um, and so basically we've addressed the concept of sacrifice, the concept of like fears, dysmorphia, uh, like let's say primitive paganism, uh, demonic figures, like little demons, hell, torture. But what are, what are other creatures that we see in horrors? What is, the, what is another genre that we see? Well, right now, what we're going to see is our ghosts. Yep, you said it, ghosts. And now, okay, we usually, at least for me, when I think of ghosts, poltergeist pops into my head. <laughs> but long before poltergeist and paranormal activity, they... Uh, we had Japanese woodblock artists creating these fantastical stories like of ghosts. Now, like the afterlife and spirits haunting the like the like um and spirits haunting the uh, the living is a very, very common thing theme in Eastern culture in like uh, Yes, Eastern culture. <laughs> I almost like I forget my East and West, but um, because like in these prints, for instance, like uh, many of them, a few of them are telling the story of this husband who wanted to kill his wife, so he poisoned her. But unfortunately, the poison didn't work. It just dismembered her and disfigured her. But upon looking at herself in the mirror, 
and seeing how hideous she was, she dropped dead. And, <laughs> I mean, basically her own selfie killed her. Uh, <laughs> And they, and so what she did is then she then became a ghost and like went on to haunt her husband for all eternity. And um, usually she appeared in the form of a lantern, as you see here in this piece. <laughs> that, is, that is her returning to haunt him. Um, that was a very common, um, like that's one of the most told stories. Like there she is again. And um, another one that was very good is this one about a monk who fell terribly in love with this um, princess. But the princess obviously wanted nothing to do with them, and so she ixnayed on the monk day, uh, had him killed, but he returned as a golem to continue to pursue her, like in, in this print right there. And, um, and yeah, so no, like, the, the, there is this strong affinity between um, ghosts and tormenting the living <laughs> i think it was just so like as usual as most stories go it's a way to make sure we behave um a lot of these stories are ref um include at least in eastern stories uh here in the japanese prints they're very much connected to um <laughs> what to do to be a good spouse and how not to kill your wife <laughs> Because now she will come out to haunt you or like you to not kill your husband, so to speak. Um, I guess tensions were high back then. I mean, okay, guys, don't let it fool you, okay? Like, I mean, marriage ain't all that bad, but <laughs> uh, that was one. Um, these are some of the earliest forms that we see of haunt of haunting works. <laughs> Max Power, how, how creepy? Yes, extremely ke creepy, right? <laughs> extremely so. Uh, let's see. Um, she is turning into a ghost and try to haunt him down. I like this idea. I know, right? I do too. <laughs> I do too. I know my mom is going to really like that story as well. <laughs> I bet there's a lot of Latin stories that say the same, you know. <laughs> I bet there's a lot of stories in South America that say the same. But I've, I've yet to hear one um, from Argentina. But I'm sure my mom probably knows a few. Um, but yeah, but this concept of like ghost death and hauntings uh, we can even see them in post-impressionist work like this one by Paul Gauguin and now um, this like this one right here is called spirit of the dead watching <laughs> now I just love the 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 body language that's happening with this reclining um, nude she's a Tahitian girl because Gauguin at the time um, went to Tahiti and he lived there for a long time and you know that moment where you're sleeping there in bed, but you feel like there's something watching you from behind, so you just peek off from the corner of your eye, and you're like, I'm a bit too scared to move. You kind of have that petrified feeling. Uh, this one, that that her body language definitely embodies that. And um, and what's beautiful in the way Gauguin implemented the elements from post-impressionism is he used his own forms and his own colors like, like colors that weren't traditional of the times like to to create this nightly scene like these rich purples and fuchsias which we don't usually associate with with the nights yeah she looks uncomfortable like and like yes yes she does look very uncomfortable indeed <laughs> like apparently the story goes uh Gorga walk, walked into this tent and he saw the girl lying on the bed like that and she actually said that like you know death was watching but there was no one there and um and, and he just found that very intriguing now side story uh she went on to become Gauguin's lover and uh but uh, poor thing probably didn't know at the time Gauguin was actually suffering from a venereal disease uh <laughs> so yeah I bet things got even scarier um uh, for the both of them after a while <laughs> but um uh but yeah no so yeah this this work is really nice in the way how it uses subjective line and form to portray this sense of fear you know like this that it's almost bodily paralysis <laughs> but um what many people have um when i say people i mean art critics they've tried to discuss is whether she is actually seeing death or is death actually seeing her 
again, going back to this idea of ghosts that live among us. So uh, we don't really quite know in this piece. We do see a figure off in the back, um, kind of there sitting. Some people have interpreted it as an old woman sitting by her bedside and death is kind of like that flicker of light up above. Um, or they, some people have, have seen it as a dove almost. I like to think death is like the old woman right there, but uh, to each their own. That's the beauty of artworks like this is that there's a bit of room for interpretation. But um, yeah, no, so so yeah, like I said, like there's there's a like there's this crossover that we get in horror tales that like some of the first original horror tales and, and most primitive form of horror tales are from folklore or should i rather say fairy tales <laughs> and um yes i know we're, we're getting we're, we're not going to talk about the brothers grim because i'm pretty sure everyone has heard of the brothers grim it has been overly analyze overly explains yes let's talk about little red riding hood let's talk about the dark version of cinderella and you know so on and so forth we all know about that so i was i here i wanted to find you guys a different um way to interpret it but um not not interpret it's still taking the same things but just to provide you guys with something different and here we are going into a movie <laughs> like i said i i narrowed it down a bit. Um, I think the horror film that is the best at implementing uh, <laughs> fairy tales and dreamlike horror film is this one called The Company of Wolves. Yes, I know, we're getting into werewolves, but we are not, we're not doing Twilight. <laughs> I refuse to do that, even though the acting was horrifying in and of itself. Uh, no, we're doing The Company of Wolves. Now, it's a British film. And it talks about the threats of temptation and sexual curiosity and meets horror and fear. All the better to eat you, baby. I didn't know we were marrying tonight. <laughs> oh gosh. Early Middle Ages. No, no, no. We're not getting. Like, well, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to marriage, but I mean. <laughs> not tonight. I'm just the embodiment of commitment tonight. Now, like, like I said, The Company of Wolves um, is really a fantastic film because it was excellent in its use of animatronics. Right there. Look how great that was. This was in 1984, and this is better than a lot of modern films I see today. <laughs> now this is a different scene, this is the wedding scene. Now it takes reference from Little Red Riding Hood, um, and uh, just basically Little Red Riding Hood falling in love with the wolf, but this is a side story, there's multiple narratives within this movie. enough for you. Lots of Marie Antoinette vibes here. I was once. Once upon a time. Don't you remember? Don't you? Good analysis, Kareem. There's definitely a reference to the movie Split here. I totally see it. <laughs> that movie was the scary. The wolves in the forest are more 
decent. someone to fund this film. The, the, I think they went um, to a few movie production studios and they didn't want to fund it because they were saying it was too dark, it was too gruesome. But then it went on to become one of the best horror pulp fictions of the time. Actually, a bit more terrifying. Are actually more terrifying. There's something more unsettling about them. Okay, so that's what I have for you guys in terms of the company of wolves. I think uh, if you're able to watch that online, definitely give it a shot. Uh, you kind of have a have to be of a certain frame of mind <laughs> to watch that film. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Uh, peacocks are supposed to represent eternity. Like, it got run over. <laughs> yes, it did. It did get run over. <laughs> yeah, maybe the peacock was a representation of immortality and eternal damnation. Uh, like, um, as, as the movie went, al went on and continued to tell that part of the woman's story, um, it went on to say how she had the baby and she would command all the wolves to come serenade her every night while she rocked the baby to sleep. And they said, well, what was that all about? It was about control. It was about having the power to control. And, um, and, when, and which leads us to the next subject of our, of our horror journey. The next subject of horror journey, because up till now, We've been talking about ghosts, demons, and werewolves. And all these things that are, in, and also like um, uh, pagan gods, so to speak, um, all, these, all these creatures that don't necessarily exist. But, in, but there is a genre of horror that is actually very real, which brings us to the monstrous feminine. Let's just let that resonate for a, for a moment. The monstrous feminine. <laughs> now, there's this... Uh, let me see. Let me just quickly fix this. I have a few pieces to show you. Okay. So, the, the first artist to grasp onto this idea of the monstrous feminine was Edvard Munch. Now, before we get too into that, um, a little bit about... Um, Munch himself. I think it's pronounced Munch, but I say Munch because if not, I couldn't spell it correctly in art history class. So if I say it incorrectly, guys, please forgive me. Uh, spelling is a talent, not a sign of intelligence. <laughs> and we're all friends here, right? We're all friends here. <laughs> um, but yes, let's see one second. Um, creative how they use the broken mirror to aid with the transformation. Yes, going back to the movie, they. Um, it is really interesting how they did that. I agree, that was one of my favorite parts in that scene and what I wanted to show you. Uh, I really love showing these older films because they had to use those elements, those, those little um, 
creative pieces to add to the storyline and to also aid them in making their special effects almost look more real and to cover up their mistakes. And uh, yeah, no, I find it, um, I, I'm really glad you, you brought that up. It's really good. <laughs> well, the scream kind of looks like like ghost face mask. <laughs> Yes, it does. Well, actually, Edvard Munch's The Scream, uh, it, it did, in, it did um, inspire the mask from the movie Scream, you know, and also our famous emoji. You, you know the one I'm talking about, guys? Oh. <laughs> it's all ed thanks to Edvard Munch, because just that little expression captured perfectly this sensation of complete and utter terror. The way how he used the, the swirling brush strokes to create this chaotic scene and really like this, and these figures in the back that appear to be either coming towards you or moving away, we're not sure. But um, a lot, there've been a lot of interpretations of this work. The most common, um, uh, commonly accepted one was that um, it's the fear of open spaces. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if that was the 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 direction uh, Munch was trying to take. But this was during um, going back to what we said, um, talking about Ensor's piece, the one with the masks. This is also um, a sim like a symbolism era. Like he really dived deep into symbolic painting. Again, symbolic painting, referencing our innermost fears and our pers and using the artist vision to like to be like our looking glass into these terrifying scenes but um but yeah like but one subject matter like i know the scream is munch's most famous work but he really dived deep into this other branch which was the monstrous feminine as i like to call it and granted you guys have to think this was the time of when they really didn't know much about the female reproductive system they generally believed that at once a month a woman's uterus would actually travel around her body like through her head and through her arms and legs and that which would cause her to go crazy <laughs> you know they would they would believe these things at the time and so a lot of um like they, there was there, so there was a lot of i should say demonic sort of or like horrific interpretations of menstruation of womanhood of <laughs> I know things are getting a little bit bloody here to say the least um but really what Enzer wanted to dive deep into in terms of the female psyche was the anguished mind like the known and unknown horrors that go on within ourselves both physically and emotionally and uh, that's why he doesn't like taking very strong realistic depictions of his work uh, even in this one the one to the right called puberty i know the title kind of lends to itself but if we analyze this piece carefully you can see how you know like this girl you know is very shy she looks very scared with her eyes wide open kind of like staring right back at us but there is this shadow passed along the bed and up into the wall this which is actually serving as a second figure in the piece it's serving as this evil being which is basically her own internal womanhood that is leaning over her creating this uh, like creating this menacing this, this evilness that is almost coming out of her and is taking away her sense of innocence like they kind of like that it's almost like that that fear that moment of seeing the boogeyman when you're in your room but in this case the boogeyman is her <laughs> the monthly enemy yeah little white ball i know right <laughs> like so what's the answer the stream title oh yes well the answer is commitment hence why i'm dressed as a bride tonight <laughs> Oh, someone was actually able to guess it right away and was really shocked. <laughs> and here I was thinking I was being witty. <laughs> um, let's see, let's see. But, uh, but yeah, another piece that Munch did that 
really captured this essence of the monstrous feminine is this one woman in three stages now as you can see we have the the pure gorgeous, long-haired virgin to the left, gazing off into the distance in a wistful breeze. <laughs> Don't worry, it's, it's like, it's, it kind of looks like me right now, actually. <laughs> oh, um, and, uh, and, but then in the middle, she finds her sensuality in this really regal pose, completely bare, and just, dripping a river just like you know um she's like she's bleeding the love people okay she's bleeding the love she's bleeding the love um but the last stage of her to the right she's now very frail she's om she's emaciated completely dressed in black and ironically that figure is the one that is the closest one standing to the man to like that is furthest to the right of the composition so munch was very smart in the way how he created these three stages to be read from left to right because that's the way we read in western society which is from left to right to create this continuous narration <laughs> i just find it hilarious how how he he puts the most frightening figure which is like you know the last stage of womanhood to be the one closest to the man <laughs> If, if this wasn't, if this painting wasn't a poster for to tell young men, find yourself a virgin, I don't know what else was. <laughs> Feminists would probably hate this. We would probably hate this. The honeymoon. <laughs> Little white ball, you so got it. Yes, the honeymoon. Um, yeah, and it's, but, but you look at this and it's really a, a, a terrifying piece in and of itself. <laughs> And it's the three stages of of, of a woman. Um, yeah, you gotta you you gotta hand it to Moon. She he had it, he he outdid himself with this one. <laughs> and the right um, the right man isn't doing so good there either. I know Crazy Wolf, right? He's he's seen better days. He's just like I am so far. He he couldn't have been pushed further away from the composition than the Virgin. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, I could talk about this piece for hours, guys, because I just find it so hilarious. <laughs> I'm the person that laughs at the face of horror, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it, so it, it's uh, <laughs> truly something, Moon, it's truly something. You can't say the, the man didn't have a way with imagery. But, um, but yeah, no, so the monstrous feminine, this subject, um, it has been used in films, uh, a lot of films, especially that we use today. Uh, like one of the first films that did it exceptionally well was the horror film Carrie. Um, did you guys see Carrie? Uh, I don't have, I haven't provided you Carrie for this class because I, I know a lot of people have seen it. And for that reason, I wanted to provide you guys with something different. Uh, Carrie was the one of, in case for those of you who don't know, um, high school girl gets bullied. Uh, high school girl, they becomes a woman. Girl, like girl, sees something. Girl knows something. Girl gets jealous. Girl, they like, goes into a raging ball of fury and murders at prom. Uh, that's all you really pretty much need to know. But it is an excellent film. The way how it. Uh, took the ideas of purity and put it into um, a horror flick. <laughs> yeah, it's the Stephen King's first book. Yes, thank you, little bar white ball. It was. <laughs> yeah, no, on Crazy Wolf, it was very intense, very good film. But if you guys think that one was intense, y'all are not ready for this one. Oh, no. Like, I mean, put on, put on your, like... Your safety nets, people, because we're about to enter the brood. Who here has heard of the brood? B R O O D. You feel bad for Carrie because she was tortured. Yes, I think in all these movies with the monstrous feminine, on some level, we feel very bad for them. We feel very bad for them. Because, especially because there are elements that. 
are out of their control. <laughs> Hi, your voice is soothing me while I'm playing Rocket League. Also informative. Oh, well, friend of the flame. That really warms my heart. I'm happy. I'm happy that I have that sultry tone, like that little soft, soft tone for you today. Like, and please continue cr playing Rocket League. I love a multitasker. <laughs> like, um, but, oh, you don't know this movie, little white ball. Okay, okay. Well, uh, in that case, we are going to start um, a few little clips of the Brood movie. Now, I had to clip this down a lot, guys. <laughs> a lot i watched this film and i was nauseous for over an hour <laughs> so for trs reasons i had to get rid of a lot of things but um but without any further ado here is the brood crazy well if you've seen parts of the brood oh right it's extremely intense <laughs> Yeah, so I love this scene right here with the spilled milk and the orange juice. Just already referencing a loss of innocence just being poured out on the floor. Now the brood are basically these group of children that are these little, almost demonic shrieking kiddos that look like this man's daughter just running about causing havoc, murdering people from left and right. There's an external deformity. I mean, apart from the lack of sexual organs. It's extremely subtle and extremely provocative. I wonder if either of you have noticed it. Has no navel. No what? No belly button. The thing has no belly button. That's right. And that means this creature has never really been born. At least not the way human beings are born. Jesus. The OJ and the milk look like <laughs> look like huge like a huge egg yolk. Real people, I never thought about that, but it really did. And that actually makes sense, especially after that scene we just watched. How these little brood children, I'm calling them, weren't really boring. But yeah, for them to have the milk and the orange juice combined like that to create like an egg, that's actually oh gosh, that's really good analysis. If I ever write a, a critique on the brood, I'm quoting you, little white ball. No, I disgust you. This is the scene I had to cut down a lot. If not, pro-lifers and pro-choices were going to descend upon us. I came here to take our daughter away and give her to somebody else. <laughs> Liar. You lie. You're lying. You're lying. I know. Clearly, you sometimes don't need a mask in order to be terrifying. You wanted to kill Candace. You make them stop or I'll kill you! Kill me, kill me, kill me! Kill me. Okay, so that was the most tame scenes I could show you from the whole movie. <laughs> Here on live stream. Uh, because yeah, no, I mean, I loved that actress, that actress's acting, the, um, our, our monstrous female, they, which is his wife, with her eyes wide open like that and just with her mouth covered in blood. I'm not even going to explain to you what she was doing in that scene because, ooh. Um, 
<laughs> but uh but yeah like it's it's so fascinating how we can take real life people and real life uh, struggles, which can either be like physical or mental struggles, and turn them into something horrific for entertainment purposes and cautionary tales, so to speak. Um, lots of similar imagery to The Shining here. Yes, MASH stars, thank you, thank you. There is a lot of similar imagery to The Shining. And, um, you yeah, know, especially in the way that it's filmed as well. Uh, definitely, the, if you like The Shining, take a look at The Brood. But like I said, you need a strong stomach for it. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm a person who, who can handle a lot of gory scenes, but this one was something else. Uh, what was I going to say about all that? Um, but yeah, what I love about that film at the very end, I know I kind of give you guys a lot of spoilers with just those few clips, but, um, but it's very interesting because the father is left thinking about oh no, what's going to happen with his daughter when she reaches puberty? Is she going to create a horde of murderous children like his wife did? And, and so it, it kind of references this idea of a single father raising a daughter and like all the awkward struggles that will come with it along the way. <laughs> And um, also the, the terrors of uh, parenthood, I guess, uh, as well. Poetry Heights took the blonde girl imagery. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Why is it that it's always the blonde ones that <laughs> end up in the horror films? That either that they're either the small ones that survive or they're the teenage ones that are the first to die. I will... Granted, I will accept that if I was in a horror film, I know I would be the first one to go. I accept my fate. <laughs> I'd be the I'd be the opening. I wouldn't even be like part of the main cast. I'm like that one that is like in the first three minutes of the movie that is just running and trips and falls and then like <laughs> instantly and the audience is left knowing like, oh, who was that person? What happened? That would that that would be the character I would play. <laughs> That would definitely be me, and I, ac I accept my fate. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so again, like I said, this is an art history. This is, this is, I've designed this horror class to be focused on art history and its parallels with film. Uh, and that is why we're going to now dive deep into German expressionism. Not to be confused, because already we've gone through surrealism, we've gone through symbolism, uh, we've gone through uh, post-impressionism, we're, co we're covering all the isms, guys. <laughs> so now we have entered um, German Expressionism, and out of German Expressionism, we got a group of artists that were called the bridge. Yes, and when I mean the bridge, I mean like a bridge, a puente. <laughs> and um, what they were, they were basically a group of young male academics, academic artists that moved into the cities and were completely engulfed and enthralled by urbanization and also like just the disgustment of cities i uh, right like for instance to the left we have ludwig kirchner uh like ernst ludwig kirchner as to say and i uh, he was especially turned off by the hustle and bustle of the streets and basically how on every corner you had a prostitute. <laughs> uh, there were women of the night, like trying to, to court, like, you know, court their every way with every man that passed by. And um, he found that exceptionally appalling. So he used the aesthetics of German expressionism. Oh, Mr. Goom, the Goom Bones, thank you. Thank you for following. Um, so he used the like um, the aesthetics of German Expressionism, where they really tried to create this sense of enclosure using these really strong angles. Like this is when like perspective really started coming into play into artworks. This sense of depth and like dramatic depth, I can say, and foreshortening. Uh, and they were, and the German expressionists were really good at using their angles, their sway. Um, it created, they were very, it was very energetic. It created a sense of modernity that was angular and edgy, 
but um but it was also disturbing they they called it a disturbing modernity <laughs> imagine if i was to walk on the street and say that oh i'm evoking disturbing modernity today thank you very much <laughs> Um, even in the and you can see this not just in the line work that he made to mark out the the streets and the sidewalks, but also the figures themselves, like just like the pointed dresses and the narrow faces, which are these horrid green faces. I mean, gosh, he did not like women of the night at all. Um, even that figure that has his that male figure that just has his leg outstretched. His leg outstretched trying to cross the sidewalk. We get this sensation of movement. We even like the way he used these violent brush strokes gives us this bustling, um, very vibrant, energetic feel. Um, and that uh, that he wanted to portray that was kind of disturbing, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, another artist that was part of the bridge group uh, was Emil Nold. Now this one. Again, we're going back to the masks, but this one is different from the intrigue, the one that Ensor did. Uh, it's different in the sense of how, he, again, he used these very, like, con these really strong complementary colors and these angular forms that um, that the German ex expressions expressionists were implementing. Oh, and what's really great about this piece specifically is that you really got um, you really get to see the influence that European artists were starting to look into what was called primitive art. And now when I say primitive art nowadays, they, they, there's like a movement that they're trying to change that phrase because they don't really like it. but primitive art is uh, essentially all artwork that wasn't European. So artworks from Africa, from the Middle East, uh, here, Nold was really becoming obsessed with African masks, which is what Picasso was doing at the time. And that's what really began to inspire these, uh, they, these like, uh, like almost disproportionate, very angular caricature faces. Have you ever analyzed The Last Supper and know the meaning and story behind the portrayal of each individual? Actually, <laughs> early Middle Ages, I have. I have. If you want me to do a class on that, please join my Discord and you can put it in the suggestions page. But I would love to do a whole analysis on that. There's even um, a lot to be said on the symbolism of each of the of how many pieces of bread there are, the amount of plates on the table. Uh, there's a lot to be said about that piece. Um, even the story of the Last Supper itself on the wall that it hangs on and the way um, it was painted. It was actually not painted properly originally. Then I'll save that for another class. But yes, I do know a lot about that piece. I actually got to see it in person, luckily enough. <laughs> like, um, it looks like artwork from Atlantis. Oh, I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> I love how the blues and emeralds background. Oh, I know, right? I know. Uh, they, they were very good at using um, phalo blue. That's the color, phalo blue. Uh, phalo blue is, if you've ever worked with it in oils, it is one of the strongest pigments there is in oil painting, and it is exceptionally difficult to use. Anything that you put phalo blue with, it's going to contaminate everything else. <laughs> uh, but um, the German expressionists, at least these two specifically, were very good at, at controlling it. I've never seen these before. Oh, really? Oh, well, then, then you're missing out, my friend. Definitely. Um, my favorite of the two is Ernst um, Ludwig Kirchner, like um, Kirchner is my favorite of the two of these artists. Uh, if like if there's anyone to look up, it would definitely be him, because uh, he has these very long, elongated figures that are just very disturbing in their own way, and they kind of stare back at you into uh, I don't know. They they captivate me every time. Oh, Ruby, you made it. Oh, well, don't worry, girl. Everything on this stream is going to be uploaded to my YouTube. You're going to love this course. I thought of you in mind. Um, yes, right now we've gone through symbolism, surrealism, uh, <laughs> basically every ism under the sun, post-impressionism, and now we've entered German expressionism. So I'm so happy you're here. You're still in line for the good stuff because, because we're going to see 
one of my this is one of uh the longest clips i have for you guys today but i swear to god it is worth it i know it's another silent film it's another silent film but it is a feast it is a feast for the eyes because they designed the whole film around the aesthetics of german expressionism which is so fascinating i mean i can't get over this film specifically for, for the artistry of it. Um, <laughs> I, oh, the, it, it was just really innovative for its times in terms of the storytelling and um, and and yeah, just the the horrific um, it, it, its way of portraying horror without sound, which is so beautiful and like. Um, Let's see. You've been discussing moving situations. Oh, you have, Ruby? Oh, I under well, don't worry, girl. Understand completely. If there's anything I can do to help you with, you just let me know, okay? Um, have you ever thought about becoming a professor? I actually was a professor. I was a professor. Um, I actually got my master's degree in fine art because I wanted to go into teaching so badly. I had a lot of terrible professors, but I mean god-awful professors um, all throughout kindergarten and my master's. And I never want someone to have the same experiences that I did. I, I, and that's why I really wanted to go into teaching. But as, luck, as fate would have it, four years ago I had a brain virus that left me in a coma and I've been having to deal with the effects of um, an autoimmune disease following that ever since. So I've been in quarantine for a good three and a half years and now I'm finally healthy enough that I can at least teach you guys here in live stream. So thank you, thank you for being here today. Uh, but I think even if I was teaching at a university setting right now, I would still be doing my streams like this. I would still be wanting to provide for you guys on here because I really do enjoy giving these lessons. <laughs> Oh, thank you. You think I'd be a very good one? Well, I, that's so kind of you to say. I'm, I'm happy I still got it. I'm happy I still got it. <laughs> All right, everyone. So the film that we're going to see, the German Expressionist film we're about to see, is one called Dr. Caligari. Now, the story is told by our friend Francis here. <laughs> now, Francis is here with a friend, and he's like, oh, gosh, look, here comes my wife. Don't look now, here comes my wife. And she's lost and she's basically kind of lost her mind, but he's just like, she didn't used to be that way. Let me tell you the story. Now this movie was excellent in the way how it does flashbacks. Now this was before they created the movie Pulp Fiction, and which was really good in doing these flashback scenes. It, they, the Dr. Caligari was the first one that did it. Now here we have our first, here we have our antagonist, who is Dr. Caligari being presented to us. Now, as you can see, everything that you see here in the set design is all hand painted, guys. It's all hand done. They, they wanted to use the aesthetic of German Expressionism to showcase that this is another world. This is another existence that is enclosed and terrifying. <laughs> Now here we have Dr. Caligari, and he's entering what is uh, basically the uh, kind of like the the hall, like the main the main hall, like uh, of the, the the town hall of the city. And I'm really getting Dr. Seuss vibes right here with the tall chair, but um, yeah, no, it's just really hilarious. And I'm not gonna lie, I wanted to showcase this scene mainly because there's a monkey right there. <laughs> But, look, but just look at the, the movement and the set design right here. Again, all hand-painted, using these angular forms to create this very disturbing, enclosed, kind of labyrinth-like um, style. <laughs> and now this is supposed to reflect an era in Germany that was where the middle class was being very oppressed. As you can see here, even in the background, all the houses are enclosed together very tightly, except for the very big one in, at the very top of the hill. Just to really emphasize how the oligarchs were oppressing the working class. Now, 
Wow, it looked like he had a Mickey Mouse glove. I know, right? I saw that too. I thought the same. He did look like he had a Mickey Mouse glove. Now, the acting in silent films I always found very fascinating, but basically this is a slasher film, and Dr. Caligari here is presenting his freak show, who is, a, is this man named Caesar, and he claims that Caesar has been asleep for 23 years, and he's showing it to this audience at a fair. And it's just like, awaken Caesar and do my bidding. And so he basically becomes an attraction at the fair. Just look at the makeup right here. I'm not gonna lie, the acting right here gives me a bit of Edward Cullen vibes from Twilight in this acting. It's like a smirk. So basically, Dr. Caligari is the only one that can command him to wake up from his eternal hibernation. But now what people don't know at the time is that Dr. Caligari is actually using Caesar, using Caesar in his sleepwalking state at night to go commit murders. So this was like one of the very first original slasher films <laughs> ever made. Now, there was a lot of um, things that you could and could not do in film at the time, and like they couldn't show blood in the film, but one way they wanted to get away with it, they found a way to get away with it, was showcasing these shadows to create the murder scene, which again, had never been done before. It was first done here. But now, on the side note, the main premise of the story is that Caesar actually falls in love with the fiancé of Francis, and Dr. Caligari, in, right here, has, had ordered Caesar to go murder her. Now, here we have a bit of the, this dramatic irony which Shakespeare first created, where we have this menacing slow walk of him about to murder the, the poor girl, and that only we, the audience, know is happening. But he stops himself because he's actually in love with her. So this is where horror and romance meet. It's almost a little bit um, Count Dracula-ish, the storyline. But of course, like any woman would, she would wake up terrified to find a man looming over her bed. <laughs> Oh, he does look a little bit like Harry Potter, yeah. Oh, Crazy Wolf, great analysis of the makeup. Yes, no, they had to dramatize the makeup a lot. Yeah, this is like one of the most iconic shots from the film, where he's just carrying her over her back. Again, look at these angular forms to create this sense of perspective that German Expressionism was so known for. Yeah, so in his frantic attempt to run away from being pursued by everyone to take her away, uh, he eventually just exhausts himself and just leaves her behind. <laughs> Definitely, this is one of the best horror films that ever made. This is just me creating snippets of what, what we had, but it's so worth it. So worth to watch just for the art alone. But 
This movie as well, it was exceptionally good at the visual effects in the way that it filmed, and I'll explain that in a moment. Francis skips leg day, yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, so, uh, basically, <laughs> let's see what is happening here. You know, so they're still trying to track down Caesar during this time. Like, they don't know where he is, and his wife has basically gone into a state of paranoia. <laughs> And they're trying to find, most of all, Dr. Caligari, because they know he's the one behind it all. Yeah, there's definitely a fantasy land in this, so I really love horror when it combines fantasy, to be honest. I know here I'm skipping a quite a few scenes, but this, this one right here, where it shows how Dr. Caligari basically originally went mad. This is a non-linear film. It jumps between present, past, 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 present, future. Like, <laughs> that's literally how it goes, this whole movie. Um, and this is where the visual effects are really, really good. This is a way, and this is how they showed Dr. Caligari losing his mind, losing his sanity. Where you just start seeing these words saying you must become Caligari, just repeatedly going over everything he sees. Now, this may not look like much, but this was really, really good for the time. Have I watched the Moon movie? No, Ruby, I don't think I have. I need to watch that. This is also colorblind friendly, yes it is. I actually had a student that was colorblind and he made the most beautiful works of art I'd ever seen. We actually found out together that he was colorblind. The oldest film? Oh, then I have to watch it. But, but yeah, so um, going to now the present, we're skipping now to the end of the movie, Francis Find, like finishes telling the story and finds him himself trying to talk to his wife in the insane asylum. But, um, but yeah, as you can see, she's just really out of it. <laughs> we queens are not free to answer the call of our heart. I mean, talk about drama queen, right? Influencer status right there. But what Francis begins to see right here that he is actually a patient of the psych ward himself. And he just starts like going mad. And here we see Dr. Caligari coming down now looking a little bit less Mickey Mouse cartoon-like. And, and Dr. Caligari seems to be running the, um, the, this insane asylum. So what the director does here is that we really don't know whether what is true if Francis's story was all made up, or if it was all in his head, or if this was some crazy plot by Dr. Caligari to keep himself from going to jail by just claiming that Francis was the one who was insane. But yeah, so this is a, a really beautiful movie to say the least. Definitely watch it. It's on YouTube, like most things that I find. <laughs> As with M and Frankenstein, there's an ambivalence around mob violence. Under Dr. Mabu's movies, there is solely a source of dead. Yes, yes, there is genuinely this, this source of, um, like, uh, his, uh, when I say mobs in movies, I think of hysteria, mass society hysteria, uh, which really actually brings us into our next subject, uh, like, um, uh, interestingly enough, so thank you for that. Um, 
a benevolent and <laughs> yes, um, yes, uh, mono mono ah, monocle drop, <laughs> monocle drop. I uh, definitely more am ambivalent, more a peaceful looking Dr. Caligari. <laughs> but yeah, now that that to me is one of the best horror films ever. I really truly enjoy it. But uh, going back to this idea of the mob <laughs> that was just brought up and hysteria and mass, like and, and people in groups, people in masses, and um, and what I mean by that, I mean in terms of zeitgeists. And when I say zeitgeists, I refer to a state of a society's impression of a time, which brings us to vampires. Dun dun dun. <laughs> now, nobody. There, there's been references to vampires all the way back from Egyptian, Roman, uh, Greek, and even Slavic times. Uh, like you know. They're, they're, they're always associated with myth, but we never got the true essence of the vampire, like the, the charming, the mystical, uh, really hardcore image of the vampire until the 18th century. And now in the 18th century, this was when we had the bubonic plague and <laughs> You know, people were dropping left and right, and usually disease has been associated with vampires, um, as well as, uh, you know, like they, they, this was an era in history that people were very much, uh, very much believed that the dead was going to come back and haunt them. That, uh, like, kind of like in, you know, in the Eastern uh, Japanese prints, kind of that idea. Um, they also believed that if you got bit by an animal, you would turn like you would turn into a vampire, so to speak, or you would suck the the blood from like from other people. Uh, I think this also was uh, the time that they started uh, dealing a lot more with dead bodies and exhuming bodies. And when they exhumed bodies, they they you know like the body changes when it starts to decompose. Things become thinner, hair becomes longer, so do fingernails, so do teeth. And, uh, and they started confusing these, they seen these corpses and saying that they were vampires. And this is where the idea of the vampire started to build up. And, uh, and we see a lot of references of vampirism in different, uh, in different storylines. Uh, like uh, and in different um, eras of art, like right here, Edvard Munch, who we were just talking about in the Monstrous Feminine, uh, he was interested in this idea of love and death and vampirism and you know and just like bloodletting, and uh, and also uh, there were a lot of academic artists. And when I say academic artists, I talk about the artists that solely created artworks that were religious based, like this one in Dante's Inferno. Uh, in Dante's Inferno, they tell this scene of these two men that are in this constant battle with each other, and one always ends up biting the other. Uh, <laughs> so there's, there's always been this level of myth mysticism and intrigue around vampires because the vampire essentially embodies everything that like you know it embodies our passions and embodies our lust and our desires and during times that were very dark and grim we were we as a society were kind of drawn to that we were we were we were both drawn and how should I put it um and scared of it. They were, we were really generally terrified of it as a society at one point as well. Some people uh, would convict others of being vampires, kind of like the Salem witch hunt, and to the point that they would behead them and like smash their heads with rocks and stuff to make sure they wouldn't come back. <laughs> um, and like, oh, you did an entire class on vampires. Oh, Ruby, I should have consulted you for this course. <laughs> The class was titled Horror. Oh, it was only vampires. Oh, that's a shame that it was only vampires because like you said, there's so much to be said on horror. horror. There is zombies, there is revenge of nature, like Creature from the Blue Lagoon, and like Godzilla is even considered a form of horror. Uh, you have the alien movies, sci-fi horror. There's so much to be said for horror. Um, granted, I've narrowed this, 
uh, this class down to be about horrors that help us cope with everyday life, like horrors that and creatures that reflect our society. So that's how I was able to create this course for everyone today. Um, but yeah, no, so the 18th century was where we began to get vampire hysteria, <laughs> as I like to call it, um, especially when there was the spread of disease and people began to latch onto this idea of wanting to be immortal, this idea of immortality as well that we kind of romanticized and fantasized about. Uh, it was not until 1897 when we got um, Bram Stoker's Dracula, that novel, that we got the image of Dracula that we see today. And that is why we are going to play a little bit of Bram Stoker's Dracula, where we see the Dracula figure and he is aristocratic, a voice who's romantic, he's debonair, educated. He was really the monster of the upper oh. class. My humblest apologies, sir. Forgive my ignorance, sir. I am uh, recently arrived from abroad and I, I do not know your city. It's a beautiful lady. You may purchase a street atlas for sixpence. Good day. I have offended you. I'm only looking for the cinematograph. I understand it is a wonder of the civilized world. If you seek culture, then visit a museum. London is filled. Excuse me. Oh, Mama, what an excellent explanation. Yes, it did come out in the era of romanticism. Her woman and those paintings I showed previously. Uh, Should a couple not be were romantic the from the romanticism era as well. So, excellent. No, you, excellent work, my friend. Are you acquainted with my husband? Shall I call the police? Husband? I shall bother you no more. Sir. We'll be talking more about romanticism later, rude. actually. If you're looking, so never fear. Permit me to introduce myself. I am Fritz Vlad of Sekai. Prince I am your servant. Smash Star is absolutely yours. Getting really mean and bad of a kind, she is. But as soon as she rejects him, she's drawn to him again. So again, it goes back to this idea of the push and pull of admiring the vampire, but also being drawn away from them at the same time. Bram Stoker, he created this image of Dracula almost as if he's like the rock and roll, of the, the, the rock and roll rebellion of the era. That he embodies art and science. Astounding. Mysticism and magic all at the same time. And sensuality, science. don't forget sensuality. How can you call this science? Do you think Madame Curie would invite such comparisons? <laughs> really? I, I shouldn't have come here. I must go. Me. I think this scene right here does a great job in showcasing how horror it can Stop this. be a part of Stop the most moments, moments of our lives. But also be our most pleasurable. Who are you? I know you. I have crossed oceans of time to find you. 
point ball. Now I can't get that out of my mind. She does look like a leopard point. Point. get transported into a scene of complete chaos to one of utter tranquility. Now, as promised, we were going to continue into the Romanticism era and like in, in terms of horror and kind of branching off from uh, vampirism because another th theme in um, uh, horror films is cannibalism, <laughs> to say the least. And, uh, and yeah, Francisco Goya, he went through, who is a Spanish painter, for those of you who don't know, he went through an exceptionally dark period of his life. <laughs> um, and uh, that he, he began painting just with oils all across like, the walls of his home, just oil directly onto plaster. Um, these really horrific dark paintings, this one specifically, Saturn devouring his son. Does anyone want to take a gander in which room he painted this one in? Now, just think of all the rooms in your house in which room do you think he might have painted this one? I'm going to try not to give it away. At least not until someone gives a guess. The nursery? <laughs> That's a good guess. Like his son's room? Okay, everyone's guessing the nursery or his son's room. I'm guessing you guys know the narrative, which is um, like, you know, Saturn, the god of Mars, the, um, uh, the gods who was foretold that one of his sons was going to overthrow him one day, so upon each of their births he would eat them. Uh, but no, actually, uh, it wasn't his son's room, and it wasn't the kitchen, but you're close. It was in his dining room. <laughs> he painted this in the dining room. So I, I don't think I'd be able to stomach, um, as beautiful of a painting as this is, I don't think I personally would be able to stomach a good... Uh, a good sandwich with this staring right back at me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, like in the Romanticism era, they really very much embraced uh, the medieval over the classical aesthetic. Uh, even though this one specifically was 
uh, Goya like, um, emitting his own uh, inner torment onto the wall. Uh, <laughs> oh, I should have known. Don't worry, little white ball. Don't worry. You were very close. The kitchen was a great uh, was a great guess. Uh, yes, like this. They like. Um, but again, it's just this is one of the most iconic works of art we've seen. I think most of you were able to recognize this right off the bat, and um, and why do we? Because it is so freaking terrifying. It is such a terrifying piece. To like you know to, like this big this like like morphing body just grabbing this lifeless figure of a small of a small child in its in its hands like that it's like oh yeah no that 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 this is like the brood okay <laughs> if you watch the whole movie you're going to see this is very much like the brood um but i know up till now we've been talking a lot about all the isms and when i say the isms like very uh <laughs> like very old works of art up to the 1800s but now we're going to fast forward a little bit and oops no we're still back we're going to fast forward a little bit to uh the 1900s and because i really want to showcase where horror play started to play a role in contemporary conceptual art uh does anyone know this piece it's actually not a photograph this was actually a performance artwork how to explain pictures to a dead hair. It was, it was one of the, the most um, revolutionary uh, performance pieces of the time. Uh, like uh, Joseph Buse, I think you, you pronounce it Joseph Buse, he was actually a Nazi war pilot. And he was incredibly distraught after the war he never he never psychologically fully recovered because of all the inhumanity he saw coming out of the war all the terrors and the traumas that um that ensued from it and he wanted to create a piece that um that reflected the that addresses that that addressed the meaning of human survival and also the futileness of you know of our everyday lives like 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 the title ex like like ah, i'm stumbling my words like the title explains how to explain pictures to a dead hair what is the purpose of for one trying to explain a work of art to a rabbit or a hare and yet alone one that is dead and so I'm going to try to explain this performance piece to you because I was a little afraid of showcasing the performance video itself because I was afraid it was a little TOS. And um, so what it is, actually, I'm going to need a prop for this. I'll be right back. OK, guys, we're going to use my <laughs> my decrepit toy rabbit. I've had this. This was my very first toy I ever had, so we're going to use them for teaching purposes, okay? So, um, so we have like so he was here in the in the art gallery. The art gallery was completely covered with artworks, and uh, <laughs> I know not the rabbit. Yeah, no, don't worry. No animals were harmed in the making of this performance art piece. So he had the like everyone was asked to leave the gallery, and but. The viewers were able to see the performance artwork through um, some windows uh, because the, he was a little bit afraid of how the piece was going to be received because no one had ever really done it before. Uh, so, they, like, so what it starts like, so he's in there in his chair with the dead rabbit, and what you can't really quite tell from this black and white photograph, but I'm going to explain it to you. His face, he actually covered it in bee honey. He covered it in honey and then applied layers of gold leaf to his face and there's been a lot of um, symbolism around it they say the honey was supposed to be a representation of community because be in order to make honey bees need to function as a community as a whole and the gold is what was to evoke how you know man is the elite supreme uh, being of the earth but really we are over glorified for what we truly are so the artist is there honey on, and gold on his face and he goes around the art gallery just going 
one artwork at a time, kind of with the dead hair, telling it, like patting its paw against the, the artwork, you know, and kind of like whispering very co like cautiously and softly into its ear. Like we can't really, we never really knew what he was saying, but just probably saying like, you know, this is a work of art, you know, like and right here is a painting of like a ship and a boat just sailing away into the distance and just he just slowly proceeds to like carry the this dead hair across like one artwork at a time and in the middle of the of the gallery is this old tree trunk and what he does is that he and as he goes past the tree trunk, he takes a big step forward with the hair and passes over the tree trunk, which is essentially this dead body on the floor. He, the, the tree trunk is supposed to be a dead uh, representation of a dead body on the floor and how, you know, just kind of like the inhumanity of it all, like how we step across, you know, things like something that's supposed to be important, which is like death and mortality and this being that is on the floor but we are we are just going about trying to teach a dead rabbit art <laughs> so it there's a there was a lot of irony behind the piece it's, it was supposed to address our core values like what like who are we as a society what are we um and um and yeah, no, it was just a very poetic piece, to say the least, a very poetic piece. And but I wanted to put it in this in this um, class specifically because of the horrific elements that it portrays, which are death, mortality, and also the fact that he used a dead rabbit. <laughs> um, maybe the hair resembles him because he feels dead and getting dead where the admirer of the artwork is just the same as him. I love that interpretation. Yes, maybe maybe the dead hair is kind of um, the way how he's lost faith in society, the way how he's lost, um, how he feels like he's lost his humanity. Granted, he was a Nazi war pilot and he has to live with that grief. How does he go back to making beautiful portraits and beautiful landscapes following what he has experienced. You know, it's kind of like how we all came out of this pandemic, like, like this COVID pandemic. And what I find so interesting is that nothing really changed in terms of the art field. Everyone kept making the same uh, bodies of work, the same artwork that, I, that they always did. Um, usually after a big war or a big crisis, we always, uh, got a different art movement, but we never got that. Um, but we never got that following COVID, which I thought was really weird, um, and I was actually hoping for it <laughs> that something would happen. Um, but I think we as a society have become so incredibly self-absorbed that um, as artists, we want we just wanted to continue focusing on ourselves because it's just too hard for us nowadays to even talk about things that are traumatic and. Uh, yet, a, like any sense of the word difficult to approach. Yeah, no, I agree, Crazy Wolf. Interesting. Little White Ball had an excellent interpretation. Baba agrees too. <laughs> okay, Baba, you're going, you're going off screen now. Okay, <laughs> let's see. All right, we're gonna just lay you down there. Uh, <laughs> But um, but yeah, no, again, really beautiful piece. But um, Joseph Buse wasn't the only uh, artist to use uh, dead animals in his work. Now, if anyone is vegetarian or uh, a little sensitive to animal rights, uh, full disclosure on this last piece, and this is actually the last one we're going to be talking about for this course, for this session, is Damien Hirst. I have a collection of pieces. And um, the mo like, for those of you um, who think of Damien Hirst, the most iconic work that Damien Hirst has ever produced uh, is The Shark Floating in Formaldehyde, which is actually titled The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living. What a tongue twister is that? <laughs> um, what a tongue twister that one is. Uh, it's. It's really interesting because people think the shark floating in formaldehyde stays there eternally, like it has not decomposed or anything. I will have you know 
they've had to change the shark at least two to three times now. It has decomposed repeatedly. <laughs> but it's not the only uh, it's not the only artwork that Damien Hirst has used um, in in using uh, animal bodies. He's used cows, sheep, pigs, uh, a lot of livestock, and sometimes he puts them in scenes like like this lamb. <laughs> like this lamb on the toilet seat uh, and right this this one this one right here we were just looking at Francis Bacon's work is it this is a re, this is a mirror representation of that oh like pegging Joe thank you for following thank you for following you're just in time <laughs> was it the topic today the topic today was actually um you're, you're just coming right at the end this is the last piece that we're talking about um with uh, fine art and horror Find out on horror, and uh, this is the last body of work that we're going to be discussing right now. Uh, we went all the way through vampires, demons, ghosts, uh, all the way. We went all the way to Asia. We even taught. Uh, we even looked at a lot of uh, horror films, a lot of black and white horror films from the German Expressionist era, the Symbolism era, the Romanticism era. <laughs> I know, but don't you worry, Joe. I'm going to be uploading all of these. Uh, all, like all of my streams to YouTube very very soon so you won't miss a thing this was I put a lot of effort into this class and I don't want anyone to miss it even if you didn't catch it on live stream uh, but um, but yeah no uh, so I think a lot of um, that is to be said for Dam like Damien Hirst's work is the title the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living I we were just right now talking about vampires and our desire for immortality. We were even discussing the the use of gore um, in terms of horror, not just in films, but also in terms of art making to address our fears and ways of how we can cope with the horrors of um, the horrors of our everyday life by putting them into artworks <laughs> like this one right here I'm getting slasher theme uh, vibes it's just this cow's body in the head on a butcher block with all these knives everywhere uh, this one gives a whole new meaning to silence of the lambs <laughs> I mean yeah <laughs> you can all the this exhibition of Damien Hirst is not for um, people with weak stomachs I, I really wanted to put the the exhibition of the of called bodies has anyone seen that one it, it was a traveling exhibition i never got to see it my sister did though um it was a traveling exhibition of um human bodies like where people got to donate their bodies when they died to then be taken apart and uh put back together in different ways to create these interesting installations um uh, for this traveling exhibition uh, it, it it was again kind of like Damien Hirst's work to uh, reference our sense of mortality, our insight, um, what, what goes on on the inside versus the outside, our internal emotions, our external appearance, vice versa. Uh, it was fun to see, like apparently they would showcase you what a smoker's body would look like and what a, like a non-smoker's body would look like. Sometimes they would put two bodies sewn together. Um, uh, very interesting uh, stuff, but I was a little afraid that it was a little TOS for uh, for, for this stream, but uh, I think that was another exhibition that was a great representation of horror and fine art put together. Because I think horror is very much misunderstood in the sense that we can use, like horror is most best used and best addressed um, in how it can, and how it's helps us cope with life it helps us cope with the traumas that we see every day because it's it's a lot of fun to it's not no fun to be scared by something and be scared by someone but for us to scare something else oh gosh is it a lot of fun <laughs> so sometimes we want to scare ourselves in order to ground us and put ourselves into our everyday lives kind of like how they started making really gruesome crucifixes um, as a way to ground people and make them come back to church and say, hey, if you do not, uh, you know, like pay tributes to Christ and the church, you're going to end up just as bad as he did, so to speak, using scare tactics um, in order to influence us as well. 
But um, but yeah, so that concludes our horror class of the day. <laughs> that concludes us, everybody. We got through it.